you're 27 times more likely to die in an e-bike accident than in a car accident. So even if you survive, there's a chance that you can face some serious damage depending on which body parts are impacted the most. In this video, we're going to discuss the e-bike safety gear you need to stay protected out there. Welcome to Healthy E-Rider, your number one guide to e-rider health and safety. I'm your host, Dr. Ram, and today we're going to be discussing e-bike safety gear. As a medical doctor, I'm going to be providing you with a medical perspective on what safety gear you absolutely need and why you need it. Before we get started, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more educational videos like this. Your primary safety measure is your judgment of various situations when you're out riding. Whether it's a car that pulls out in front of you, a slippery surface, or another rider who isn't looking ahead and rear ends you, you have a limited window period in which you can become aware of a threat and you can respond to it. So usually with experience comes better judgment, anticipation, and response to dangers around you. But even for the most experienced e-biker, there are situations that are completely out of your hands for whatever reason. Whether it's rider error and you hit the front brake too hard, too fast, and go flying over your handlebars, or it's a driver who turns at a traffic light as you're going straight and you end up smashing into his side and flying off your e-bike. You're going to hit something either way. There are certain body parts that aren't meant for that kind of impact. The most susceptible of which is your brain. You have a thick skull to protect your brain against a certain amount of impact. Your brain is just floating around in there, but when you hit your head, your brain is traveling at the same speed as your skull. The only way it can stop is to hit the insides of your skull. Once your skull stops, it tends to rebound in the opposite direction. Again, your brain will travel in that opposite direction until it hits the opposite side of your skull. This brain trauma can rupture small blood vessels, creating a small bleed or a bruise called a contusion. Or it can lead to a more severe, widespread form of bleeding called a hemorrhage. Brain trauma can also cause swelling of the brain even in the absence of a bleed. If there's one thing that the brain does not like, it's pressure. It's a tight fit inside of your skull for your brain. Any further crowding of that space can exert large amounts of pressure on your brain. Bleeding and swelling both exert large amounts of pressure on the brain, which can be life-threatening. When trauma occurs and there's no visible damage to the brain on medical imaging, but there is an alteration in mental function, this is called a concussion. When an object, including fragments of your skull, pierce your brain, this is called a laceration or a penetrating injury. Any combination of these forms of traumatic brain injury can occur in an accident. Traumatic brain injuries can have short-term, long-term, and life-threatening consequences. Less severe forms of traumatic brain injury may result in headache, altered balance, depression, difficulty concentrating, nausea, and lethargy. More severe forms may lead to loss of consciousness, severe headache and vomiting, loss of memory, difficulty walking, seizures, and even coma. It could take months to years for your brain to heal and for these symptoms, among others, to resolve. In more severe cases, some symptoms may be permanent. Untreated brain injuries can lead to permanent brain damage and resulting loss of motor skills like moving your hand, being able to walk, or speaking, as well as personality changes. In the movie Concussion, starring Will Smith, you could see football players suffering personality changes and other consequences of concussion they sustain playing football. These are not exaggerations. They are very real consequences of severe, repeated concussions leading to a condition called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, which was discovered by Dr. Bennett Omalu. While it's highly unlikely that you're going to suffer CTE from an e-bike accident, the point is that traumatic brain injury is a very real threat to your physical and mental health, and you need to take it seriously. If you fall and hit your head, even if you're helmeted, and especially if you're not helmeted, it's always best to immediately seek medical attention to rule out any serious injuries. Some hematomas 
may cause symptoms that initially subside, but continue to grow and place increasing amounts of pressure on the brain, resulting in an eventual loss of consciousness, depressed breathing, and death. You also don't want to miss a cervical or collarbone fracture that could damage your spinal column or vital blood vessels. Now I know this all sounds scary, but the good news is that there's something very simple you can do to minimize your risks of most of this happening at all. Can you guess what that is? That's right, wear a helmet. It's so simple, but most people today are not wearing a helmet. And I get it, it's not always seen as the most comfortable, or stylish thing to wear on your head, but that doesn't have to be the case. Not all helmets are created equally, so let's take a look at how helmets can prevent abrasions, contusions, concussions, hemorrhages, and penetrating injuries. The outer shell of most helmets is usually made of fiberglass, Kevlar, or polycarbonate plastic. Just below that, there's usually a layer made of expanded polystyrene foam. The innermost layer is usually made of some type of cushion fabric. The outermost layer is designed to prevent penetrating injuries, to provide abrasion resistance, and to keep the underlying components of the helmet in place during impact. The expanded polystyrene foam layer is designed to absorb some of the energy from the impact, preventing a large amount of it from reaching the skull and the brain. The innermost layer adds some impact and abrasion protection helps wick away sweat, keeping you dry and cool, and keeps the helmet in place in concert with the chin strap by using your face as additional surface area for helmet grip. Some helmets include an additional layer called MIPS, or M-I-P-S. MIPS stands for Multidirectional Impact Protection System. It redirects rotational forces that occur when your helmet hits the ground or an object at an angle. These rotational forces are often responsible for traumatic brain injuries like concussions. MIPS works by allowing the helmet to move relative to your head 10 to 15 millimeters in any direction so that your helmet receives more of the rotational force than your head. If MIPS is an option in your helmet selection process, it's probably better to have it in your helmet than not. For a helmet to do its job optimally, it must stay in place. If during an accident, the helmet moves around excessively or even comes off, its effectiveness decreases drastically. The most important factor when it comes to keeping your helmet in place is that it fits your head properly. This absolutely requires that you measure the circumference of your head using a tape measure and following the sizing chart provided by the manufacturer. Do not assume that because you wear a certain size hat or piece of headwear that it will be the same for your helmet. Big mistake. The shape of your head will also determine which helmet is right for you in terms of proper fitment. Three common head shapes are round oval, intermediate oval, and long oval, with intermediate oval being the most common of the three. A properly fitting helmet adheres closely to the contours of your head and hardly moves around when you shift it around on your head. Too loose and it'll move around during an accident, decreasing its effectiveness. Too tight and it will cause pressure spots on your head and give you a headache. It should cover right above your eyebrows in the front and the base of your skull in the back for adequate protection. The final component of keeping your helmet in place is the chin strap. Your chin strap must be fastened securely at the intersection of your jaw and your neck. It should be tight enough to prevent your helmet from slipping upwards and potentially off your head during an accident, but still have some room to allow you to open and close your jaw and swallow. You shouldn't feel like you're being choked. There are different types of helmets that vary based on the level of protection. Offering the least amount of protection are novelty helmets that just cover the upper portion of your skull. At best, they offer some level of abrasion protection, but that's about the extent of it. No one should be wearing these kinds of helmets. At the other end of the spectrum are full face helmets, which offer the most protection for not only your head, but also your face and eyes as well. Motocross helmets are just below full face helmets in terms of head and jaw protection, but lack eye protection. That said, they can and are often paired with safety goggles to keep your eyes safe from flying debris and wind. Below motocross helmets are three-quarter helmets and modular helmets, offering full head protection and eye protection, but no face and jaw protection. Finally, right above novelty helmets are half helmets that provide just enough protection for your skull alone. All of you should be wearing 
full face helmets. Traveling at speeds upwards of 25 miles per hour places you at high risk of significant trauma to your head and the face that could result in a traumatic brain injury. The last point I'd like to touch on is safety ratings. Most helmets will have some kind of safety approval or certification. The most common safety rating organizations are DOT, ECE, and Snell. Each system uses its own criteria against which helmets are tested for safety. I won't go too much into detail in this video about the criteria, but the key takeaway here is that your helmet should be at least DOT certified, ECE and or Snell certified, in most cases even better, but they will cost you more. I chose this full face helmet. It's both ECE and DOT certified. It has a carbon fiber outer shell, expanded polystyrene foam layer, and comfort liner with emergency release cheek padding. In case you're down and or unconscious, an emergency medical personnel need to safely remove your helmet. I chose this helmet because it met all the safety check boxes I was looking for and it happens to be pretty cool looking as well. So far it's well ventilated, not too noisy, and isn't too heavy on my neck. Thankfully I haven't been in a situation to test it out and I hope I never will be. Thank you for watching this episode of Healthy E-Rider. I hope you enjoyed this video on e-bike safety gear. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button below for more videos like this. Remember our mission as Healthy E-Riders, live to ride another day. I'll see you in the next one guys, peace.